All right, here we go. Havoc. Welcome back to Vlad TV. What's up? What's up? I wish we were meeting under, uh, you know, happier circumstances right now. You know, definitely very, very sorry for your loss. Thank you. So, you know, we've done a lot of interviews over the years, even before there was Vlad TV, when I was still doing DVDs and so forth. But what I want to focus on is the Mob Deep story, which I think is very important. Yeah. So, you grew up in Queensbridge. Definitely, no doubt. What was it like growing up in, in Queensbridge in the 80s? I mean, uh, growing up in Queensbridge in the 80s was like, I, I guess, any other, you know, projects in New York, only that Queensbridge was probably like the biggest, one of them all. Um, you know, drugs, uh, shootings, killings, stabbings, and, you know, just shit of that nature. Like, before you got into music, how involved were you in all that? Were you just mostly kind of to yourself? In involved in, like, what exactly? And all the street shit. And, the, oh. the, you know, the violence, the drugs, the crime. I mean, for the most part, I, I, was, I was pretty neutral. You know, I tried my hand at a few things, you know what I mean? But I just realized that none of that shit was for me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I tried to sell my little drugs and, you know, carry a few guns and but I, I just seen the way you know a lot of my friends was getting locked up and some of them killed and I, that's something that I didn't really see for myself. Yeah that was definitely a good move for you at that point. It, I mean for sure you know what I mean uh, for the most part I was a, a, a pretty uh, well-rounded kid smart you know what I'm saying influenced by you know my surroundings to a certain degree you know? Yeah. Now your dad was actually a DJ. Yeah. Okay. Is that what kind of got you into the music thing? Um, I mean, it definitely was a big influence on me, my father being a DJ, because just constantly hearing music all the time, like, you know, in my sleep, going, you know, while, while we sleeping, me and my brother and sister, my father just DJing all night long. So that definitely was a big influence. So at what point did you start looking at music and hip hop as something that you could actually do yourself? Um, around the time when I was about like maybe 12 or 13, watching like music video box and stuff like that. So I used to just watch, you know, uh, Run DMC and Salt and Pepper, LL, all of them just doing their thing. And not to mention Molly Maul being from around my way, you know what I mean? So like ever since I can remember, you know, that was even a bigger influence that somebody from actually where I lived like made it big. Like and he was just looked at as like a god, you know what I mean? I mean at least in the eyes of us little kids, you know what I mean? Marley coming through, Shane with his two different pairs of pumas and all of that and you know, I remember seeing, you know, uh, Biz coming through, just all these different artists. So, yeah, when I was like around 12, 13 is when I actually was like, you know what, I think I could, I could do this shit, you know what I mean? I, I didn't know the first thing about writing or anything like that, but I just tried my hand at it. Okay, so did you start doing it on your own or when you met Prodigy? No, I started doing it on my own at first, and this is like before I even met Prodigy, you know what I mean? So I didn't really even had an idea that I would end up in a rap group. It was just something I was doing on my own because I wanted to be a rapper. Okay, so what was your first rap name? <laughs> my first rap name was the first rap name that I, that I have now. It was like, it was Havoc. It always was... Havoc, it wasn't nothing. Matter of fact, I'm lying. Uh, I just went by my real name, Kiwan. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't even make up a rap name for myself. You know what I mean? It was just my real name. Okay, so you start, you start rapping, 12 or 13, and you're like writing down your rhymes. Are you laying anything down? Because, you know, th th this is not 2017 when everyone has a laptop and they right. can record. Like, you actually needed studio equipment to actually record something back then. Right. So at that point, 
it was just writing everything down in the notebook. You know what I mean? And just saying it, memorizing it, you know, spitting it for your friends and stuff like that. I, it was no way in hell that I had a chance to record it or hear myself record it. It was just all in the notebook. Okay, so when did you and uh, Prodigy hook up? Me and Prodigy hooked up in like 1989 in the High School of Art and Design. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are aware of it because we, we told the story a lot of times. We hooked up in the High School of Art and Design, which is in Manhattan on uh, 57th Street, 2nd Avenue. Okay, and was Prodigy, did he have the, the rap name back then or was he some, someone else? Nah, he was definitely somebody else. That, uh, he was, we, we used to call him, first the school called him Pee Wee, and, but his first rap name was The Golden Child, because he, he looked like The Golden Child, you know what I mean? He was golden. Right, was the Eddie Murphy movie out during that time? <laughs> I'm sure it was, I'm sure it probably was. That's why, that's where he probably got the name from, The Golden Child. Right, okay. So, you guys met, at what point did you start to decide that you guys might actually form a rap group? Um, well, Prodigy already had like some kind of situation going on with Jive Records, like a, a demo deal or something like that. But me and him started becoming so much of good friends that he actually kind of vacated that, that, that deal with Jive in order to form a group with me. You know what I mean? That's how much of good friends we had become. You know, because we just was on the same page. And it was like, yo, man, we should do this together. So he, like, kind of left that job situation alone, which would have been a very dope situation for him. You know what I mean? It was, like, major. Like, you know, we only, like, he was 14, I'm 15. Like, who gets a deal at that time? And he did a song with High Five, which was a, a R and b group at the time. And, like, you know, the sky was the limit for him at that moment right there. Yeah, and it ended up on the soundtrack of... Some movie, I, I, it might have been Boys in the Hood. The song was called Too Young or something like that. Right. And at the time, like, let me think. Jive Records had, like, Boogie Down Productions. Right. Uh, a Tribe Called Quest. Were they on, on Jive at that time? Yep. Yep. I believe Yeah, so, so. they are like a, a hip-hop powerhouse. Yeah, they was. And like I said, he, you know, he didn't even, uh, he vacated the situation, you know, based on me and his new friendship. So, I mean, he could have had it good, you know what I mean? He, it, it was no looking back, you know what I mean? But he saw something in us, like I saw, and he was like, fuck that deal. Like, let's, let's, let's get busy. Wow, that, that's crazy. That was P. So back then, you guys weren't Mob Deep. You had a different name. Nah, we wasn't Mob Deep yet at this point. We was the Poetical Prophets. Okay, so why the name the Poetical Prophets? I mean, you know, back then it was like, you know, a little bit of that, uh, you know, conscious rap was still hanging around, you know what I mean? So we was gravitating towards like kind of what was at the moment and at the time. So, you know, he's like poetical prophets, you know what I mean? Blah, 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 blah. And we kind of ran with that name. So you guys hook up, you're now the poetical prophets. Right. And I heard that you guys actually used to write for each other. Yeah, pretty much, you know what I mean? You know, I, I used to write a little bit for him. You know, later on he would write some things for me. You know, it wasn't really a big deal. You know what I'm saying? We was in a group, so it was like, whatever. Okay, so you guys hooked up as a group. Now, you're living in, in Queensbridge. Yeah. Uh, but he's living in Long Island, right? Yeah. And he would come to Queensbridge and hang out with you, or how, what would happen? Yeah, um, I would go hang out with him in Long Island, you know what I'm saying, a lot. And he would come hang with me in Queensbridge a lot. So it, 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 went, it worked both ways. Like, he already had, you know, a, a, you know, a little crew in Hempstead that I got really acquainted with, really good friends with at the time. I, and when he came to Queensbridge, he gained some friends, you know what I mean? Like, so we was in between both places and then everything almost all came together, like, you know what I mean? Okay, now you, you're in Queensbridge, so you're, you're in that environment of the projects, you know, but you're, you're essentially, like you said before, not really trying to get into and mixed up in all that criminal shit. 
prodigy at the time, where was he in his life? Um, he wasn't really, you know, on, on any criminal shit that I, I that I could remember. You know what I mean? He pro he was basically like in the same boat with me. Our mind was on music. You know what I mean? And but you know, he he had a thing for carrying guns and shit. Like he that was his thing. He 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 liked to do that. So you know, he wanted to protect himself. So you know. That's one thing I could say, if it was any kind of element, that was one of them. He was, he was good for that. Was there a particular situation that caused Prodigy to carry a gun all the time? Nah, it was just that he was just on some shit where, like, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we, we hang around the wolves, so he was like, you know, just in case, this is how he, he, how he moving. Yeah. Because I remember uh, Puffy said that you guys used to stop by his office after school and you guys would always have guns on you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's very true. You know what I mean? So that wasn't a misrepresentation. Okay. Now, you guys are the poetical prophets and you guys are putting together, I guess, your, your project at this point? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, how much music did you guys record before that first... Poetical Prophets uh, album dropped. Um, we record we recorded a lot of music because um, we had gotten a deal with Four from Broadway. You know what I'm saying? But at, but at that point we wasn't Poetical Prophets no more. We never recorded a, 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 a record, a you know, professional record as Poetical Prophets. Ah, okay. We, okay, so by the time you guys got the Fourth of Broadway deal, you guys already changed your name to Mob D. To Mob D. Okay, so why the name Mob Deep? Mob Deep because that was a, like a saying around my way in Queensbridge, what we used to use. Like, you know what I'm saying? If we was rolling mad deep, it was a bunch of us. We'd be like, oh man, last night it was crazy. We was Mob Deep. So, you know, that was one of the first things that came to my mind. And the reason why we had changed it was because I remember we was trying to, Puffy was trying to sign us at the time, but he was like, yo, you know what I'm saying? That niggas is ill and all of that, but y'all got to change your name. You know what I'm saying? So we ended up changing our name to Mob Deep, but not even signing to Puff. Okay, why not? I guess because Fourth from Broadway threw, threw more money at us at the time, and we was persuaded by the older people around us, like, nah, fuck that, go grab the money, da 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 da, you know what I'm saying? While Puffy was like, fuck the money, look at the plaques on the wall, you know what I'm saying? Both valid arguments, you know what I mean? But we ended up going for the bread. Right, and you were how old at the time? 16. Yeah, and I mean, I guess in retrospect, like, Bad Boy, I mean, they were already legendary back then. Right, and, and Puff was legendary, period, even before, because yeah. he, and I, matter of fact, I don't even think he had, he didn't even have Bad Boy yet when, we, when he wanted to sign us. Oh, he, so he was, was still, still at, at uh, was it Harris? Uh, he was still at Uptown MCA. Uptown MCA, yeah, yeah, right. He was like still there, you know what I mean? So this was even before Bad Boy. Okay, did he have Biggie around him? Nope. Not that, not, not that I could remember. You know what I'm saying? When I'm thinking of the timeline, in my mind, no. Okay, so he didn't have Biggie, he didn't have Craig Mack. I mean, he could have had them, but they wasn't out yet. Okay, so he was still just working for Uptown at the time and trying to form his own label. If I could remember correctly, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Because this is when he was promoting parties too at the same time. Like the yeah. Red Zone and all of those different places he would promote parties at. Okay. Now, Large Professor and DJ Premier, I heard, started to kind of help you guys out early on. Yeah, they did. And uh, when we had first got, got our deal, uh, I can remember Primo coming all the way to Long Island to fuck with us and vibe with us, you know what I mean? Like, he didn't have to do that. He could have just got a check, threw us a beat, and that was it. But he used to come to Long Island just to kick it with us and vibe with us and, you know what I mean, on some big brother shit. Like, and, you know, that was, like, to this day, when I think about it, that was valuable. Yeah, DJ Premier, I mean, one of the greatest hip-hop producers, period. Without a doubt. 
Yeah, and then you know, large professor as well, another legendary figure. For sure, and and I had already met large professor before we even got a deal. You know, hanging with Nas and them, and before Nas got on, I remember going to large professor crib and left rack with Nas and Akinelli and stuff like that. And then sometimes they used to bring, uh, you know, large professor beats and play them back in the projects at Nas crib. And the beast was mind blowing. Yeah, no, uh, extra, you know, extra P is phenomenal at what he does. Yeah. So you guys have your first album on Fourth and Broadway, Juvenile Hell. Yep. Oh, why that name? You know, we was young. You know what I'm saying? Felt like we was living in hell. You know what I'm saying? The projects and all that. So we was like Juvenile Hell. You know what I mean? Okay. Now, did the did the Unsigned hype in the source, that come before or after that album? That came before the Juvenile Hell album. It came before because that's what really got attention on us. The unsigned hype got us the attention to be able to get a deal. So they put us in the unsigned hype like maybe a year before as Poetical Prophets. Right. And, and back then, if you got an unsigned hype, that guaranteed you a major label deal. It, it was a guarantee you getting a deal. So that was like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, major. We on the block, showing the magazine, like, oh shit, yo, we in the magazine. Instantly got us a deal. Right, and some of the other people who got an unsigned hype are like Biggie, Eminem, Common. Exactly. The list goes on and on. Exactly. So yeah. you know how important that was. Exactly. So you guys dropped Juvenile Hell, but it doesn't really do the numbers. Yeah. It didn't do nothing uh, for, for many reasons, but, uh, you know, because 4th and Broadway was on the downslide, you know what I'm saying? And we didn't even look at it like that. We was just happy to have a deal, you know what I'm saying? And 4th and Broadway wasn't the uh, popping label at the time anymore. And, you know, just all the pieces wasn't there, so it didn't do well. Okay, so essentially your deal was over with 4th and Broadway. After Gone. That. They dropped us. Oh, you got dropped? Okay. Yeah. So how did it feel to do all this work, put out this album, you know, you're an unsigned hype, everyone's checking for you, you put out this album and it just doesn't do what you wanted it to do? <sighs> that shit hurt because, you know what I'm saying, you know it's people like waiting for your downfall, you know what I'm saying, you come into all this money, you shooting videos, you feeling yourself, the shit fails, now you gotta go back home on some like, damn, what, what just happened? No, I don't got no more money, video not popping, shit ain't getting played on the radio. That could really, really fuck you up. I mean, was there a point where both of you guys were like, fuck this rap shit? <laughs> Never. That, that shit only made us wanna do it more. You know what I'm saying? It could have either or effect. It could make you want to say, fuck it, or go harder. And we just went harder. Okay, so after you got dropped from 4th and Broadway, what started to change in the process? I mean, like, it was just, we, we had to look at why it failed. Or, you know, to me, in my eyes, you know, Pete, he might have had a different opinion. But to me, in my eyes, it was like, we was, we was dope. But we had, all, you know, these people that wanted to kind of produce us, you know what I'm saying, and, you know, throw their little two cents in on how we should be and this, that, and the third. That's how I felt, you know what I mean? I, and plus we was new, so I was new, so I wasn't like really, I was scared to take the reins, you know what I mean, so, so to speak. So I was just like letting people do it and, you know, just going with the flow a little bit. Okay, so like, were you producing on that first album or no? Yeah, I produced like two or three tracks on there, but you know. Okay, but but not not to the extent of what happened afterwards. Right. So after that first album, did you start taking production more seriously? Definitely, because I just was, you know, where else was we gonna get beats from? You know what I'm saying? I wasn't gonna go get beats from the people that did work on the last album. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I was like, fuck it, man, let's, let's just do our own shit, you know what I mean? So that's what okay. I started doing. And I heard that Prodigy actually taught you how to sample? Yeah, because his grandmother bought the equipment, you know what I mean? She bought all the equipment, you know, 
went to his crib, all the equipment's there. I'm like, what? He already had to jump on me because he was there when it came into the house. So, you know, he already was fucking with it, you know what I mean? I came over there like, what, how you do this shit? Like, how you do it? You know, like, part of me, son. Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? And I just kind of like Debo my way in on it because I just love that shit so much. Right, because as time went on, it seemed like you became more the producer in the group. I know that Prodigy did some like co-production, but it seemed right. like you became the main producer of Mob Deep. Yeah, and that, that was just by like default, you know what I'm saying? It, it wasn't like I was trying to be that, you know what I mean? Because I, I wasn't doing it for money or nothing like that, but I just felt so creative in that way that I just, that's how it, it, it fell into place. Yeah. So then you guys get into Loud Records. Like what, what led up to that situation? Well, um, the, the record, the Juvenile Hell record didn't work, but we still had like good street reviews. You know what I'm saying? Like, so people that was closer to the street with their ears to the street, like somebody like Maddie C or, or, or Scott Free, from afar, they probably must have believed in us, heard that we got dropped and got to us through, you know, uh, associates, you know what I'm saying, familiar people, like somebody like a Bones Malone or somebody like that, you know what I mean? So they came to us and said, yo, we want to have a meeting with y'all. We got this thing called Loud Records or whatever, whatever. Steve Riff can run it, you know, can you come up to the office? You know, we, 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 we want to sign y'all. And that's how we got up to Loud Records. And Loud Records was just one room, not even no bigger than the room that I'm sitting in right now with Steve Rifkin right there, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, Maddie C told me a lot about y'all, Scott Free, um, I wanna sign y'all. He only heard one song. We, we, we only had one song. And he was like, fuck it, I wanna sign y'all. He said, I got a group already, it's the Wu-Tang Clan. Didn't know who they was at all, you know what I mean? So I was just like, whatever. Just the fact that somebody was giving us a second shot was just like, fuck it. Like, cause who would fuck with somebody that they album didn't even really do nothing from the first time? Like that don't happen even these days. Right, and you guys got, was like 60 or 70,000 for that deal? Yup, 60, 70. Which, which, which wasn't a huge amount. It was just enough to actually put it together. Yeah, but for teenagers, you know what I'm saying? That shit was like, word, I fuck with that all day. Yeah. So you guys start putting together the infamous. Yup. Started. Go ahead. Now, Nas came in to do Eye for an Eye. Yeah. Now you, you had known Nas before this. Yeah, from from the neighborhood. I used to hang out with them, you know, on his block, whatever. When we all was less would be rappers, ambitious dudes wanting to get on, you know, we used to hang around them. Now, when you guys were working on the infamous, uh, Illmatic was already out. Yeah, it was out. <laughs> okay, and this was like the biggest East Coast album in like a decade. Yeah, it was crazy. It, w it was out, and you couldn't walk around the projects without hearing halftime. Right. I mean, that whole album. I mean, I mean. And then, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about. I'm talking about before time. the album even came out. You know, halftime was out for that movie, I think it was Zebrahead or something like that. And that, that was just built up the anticipation and then he did Live at the Barbecue and all those other things. So he was on his way already. Okay, so at that point with Nas being as big as he was, you know, what was the story of him agreeing to go and jump on this, this album for, you know, a group that was still kind of up and coming? Cause he wasn't doing a lot of features back then. Nah, he wasn't doing a lot of features. But what really uh, probably compelled people to work with us that did, like, you know, the Woo, Nas, not only was we was in the same circle, but we already had Shook Ones out. You understand what I'm saying? So that was like, that took off after a while and was like, oh shit, like, these dudes are serious. Like, you know, it, 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 it built our credibility up. So people, you know, it was, it was you know, they worked with us. Okay, and this is... Shook Ones, the original Shook Ones or Shook Ones Part 2? Shook Ones Part 2. Aha. Okay, so Shook Ones Part 2 came out before 
well before the album. Yeah, definitely. Like maybe a year before the album. Aha. Okay, I, di- I didn't realize that the, the time the timeline. Yeah, because Shook One so ca- came out in '94, and then the album came out in '95. Okay, and I remember when Shook Ones came out. I remember I was living on the West Coast, and everyone was talking about them two dudes with the Hennessy shirts. <laughs> Word. Like yo, them dudes with the Hennessy shirts is on some shit right now. Yo, you gotta check that out. Word. It- it was crazy, man. I, it was just unbelievable, man, to go from nothing to instant something. Like, you know, that shit was crazy. P, you know, you got to credit P a lot, you know what I'm saying? Because he was the one that made the shirts, you know what I'm saying? He had a vision, you know what I'm saying? He was like, yo, we going to wear this for the video. I'm like, fuck it, okay. You know what I'm saying? We wear that, you know what I mean? I didn't give a fuck what we wore, but he... Knew he was like, yo, here you put this one on, I I wear that. He was good at that. Right, and Steve Rifkin, when I interviewed him, he pointed out that I remember when Shook Ones Part Two came out, they had the Hennessy shirts on. They spelled it wrong. Oh, they spelled it wrong. Yeah, (laughs) on purpose or on accident? I think on purpose. So there wouldn't be any copyright or whatever. Maybe I don't even remember, but you know, the shit said Henny. I don't care how it was spelled. It it was you knew it was Hennessy. You know what I mean? Right, and the the imagery in that song, when, when Prodigy said, uh, was it, put, bash you in the face, stab your brain with your nose bone, was like, okay, this is, this is something a little different here. <laughs> yeah, when I think about it to this day, it always fucked me up no matter how many times I listened to the song, just hearing him say certain shit. You know, at the time when he first made it, I didn't really pay t- too much attention to it, like, but as the years was going by, I'm like, damn, what the fuck? This nigga's crazy. Like, you know, when you're close to somebody, you really don't notice a lot of things until you step back and listen to it. And I'm like, yo, this nigga is crazy. The, the verse is just retarded. Yeah, I think, I think he got you on that verse, just to be I, honest. I, I think he got me on a lot of fucking verses, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 90%, 99, he nigga went in. I never really paid attention to it, so that's why I was able to be comfortable, uh, you know, as who I was, you know what I'm saying? It didn't bother me if he was just so crazy on the lyrics, you know what I mean? I, I was good, I'm, I'm fine, I'm making the beats, my rhymes is all right, but this nigga's a beast, you know what I'm saying? And that's what it was. Definitely, that, you made that beat. Right, so I was straight, you know what I'm saying? It was all good, you know what I mean? I, I did the beat. Yeah, and the beat was so was so different from anything you heard, like it was, it was melodic, but it was like real dark at the same time. Like, and that was, you, I guess you would just like twisted up a bunch of samples and sped them up and so forth. Yeah, I was slowing them down, speeding them up, doing all crazy kinds of things to samples that, you know, I was experimenting. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the production on that was incredible. Thank you. So, so Nas comes in and he does Eye for an Eye with Raekwon. Yeah. And that was the first time all, all y'all three were together. Word. I remember us trying to set it up. We got everybody in the studio. We didn't even have, did we have the beat yet? Like we, we did like kind of have a beat, but I remember just redoing the shit over and making the beat right there on the spot. You know what I mean? And, we just made this shit, like, you know, Pete came up with the chorus, that shit just was crazy, you know what I mean? And yeah, and, and I might have to say that was one of Nas's greatest verses ever. The drug dealer's dream, you know, keys on the triple B, like, yo, like, he absolutely murdered it. Like, when he did that verse, would you guys just sit around and look at each other like, wow. I already knew he was gonna kill it, you know what I mean? So, I wasn't even really, I was like, what, I, I, I'm just going to write whatever, so I, I'm not even trying to compete against these niggas. You know what I'm saying? I'll just do you. You know what I'm saying? That's how life should be. Don't compete against this. Just do you. That's what I had right. to do. And, and I guess he had, there was a couple different versions uh, of verses that he did or, or something? Yeah, because he was a perfectionist, you know what I mean? So, you know, he did like maybe two or three different verses, you know what I'm saying, to it. Yeah, incredible song. And and 
Wu Tang showed up on two different songs on that album. I mean, Eye for an Eye and what, Bust Back at You? Right Back at You, yeah. And, and Right Back at You. Because right. we and, was. And that just, was just, you know, essentially Loud Records just kind of putting two of their artists together? Um, nah, we was, because we, me and P was feeling them. You know what I'm saying? We was feeling the Wu. Like, they was the biggest fucking group in the world. You know what I'm saying? These niggas was popping. And. We was label mates, so we would often do things together, you know what I mean? Events, shows, so it was inevitable that we, we, we clicked with one another, you know what I'm saying? And Ray and Ghost was like two of the ones that we like really clicked with. We used to hang with them niggas in Staten Island every now and then, you know what I mean? We just clicked, so it wasn't hard to get them on the album, you know what I mean? Because they was like, whatever, we fuck with y'all. Right, and I think Raekwon said that those sessions with you guys was kind of what sparked off uh, the Cuban Links project. I'm not surprised, man, because it was like, you know, you, 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 you heard the Cuban Links, you know, the Purple Tape, that shit was like the infamous album fucking 10.80, like, you know what I'm saying? The shit was incredible. So on the song Temperatures Rising, your brother, Killer Black, was actually on the run for murder. Right. Well, what was that situation about? That was a real stressful time, you know what I mean? My brother on the run for a body, you know what I'm saying? We, we just getting our feet wet in the game. Things are supposed to be a happy time. And in the background, I got to hide my brother, you know what I'm saying? I got to hide him somewhere. You know what I mean? It was just mad stressful. Right, because when you hide somebody on the run, you in turn can get arrested as well. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know about all of that. Maybe, the, you know, maybe the person that he probably was, you know, that I had him with probably could have got locked up. But me helping him, I wasn't giving a fuck about getting locked up for that. I was, fuck it, lock me up. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Right. No, I'm just saying, but just the whole stress around that, like, I'm sure it was crazy. Yeah, the stress was because, like, okay, yeah, hiding him, you know, that was, that was stressful, but not knowing when he could get caught, and if he get caught, is the police going to fucking kill him? You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, you never know when he could get back, you know, when you get that bad news that he got caught, you know what I mean? But I ended up getting that news. Right, and, but you, and you actually decided to throw that situation on a song as it was happening. Right, and this is before he even got caught. You understand what I'm saying? So we was just turning, you know, life into art. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was, it, it just, you couldn't make up a song like that if you wanted to. Right, and eventually, wait, it went to trial and he beat it. Yes, we went to trial, we beat it. Well, cause most times, most people just plead out. So he actually decided to fight it all the way and go to trial. Even if he wanted to plead out, I wouldn't have let him plead out. We was fighting that off top, you know what I'm saying? And before that, you never heard nobody beating nobody's in the hood like that, you know what I'm saying? But that was my brother, you know what I'm saying? My, my brother, like we, we, I'm not trying to see my brother in, in the jail for 25 years, so. Right. So you had a verse on that album that said, no matter how much loot I, I get, I'm staying in the projects forever. Were you really in that mentality back then? Like you were just gonna stay there forever? You know, I definitely was on that mentality because I was so ingrained in the hood where I was on that mentality. I was like, yo, because you know, you see motherfuckers get money and then they just forget about where they come from. So it was more along those lines. But I also meant it in a literal sense, you know what I'm saying? Just on some like, yo, fuck that, no matter. Because I was so comfortable where I was at, you know what I mean? Thinking like, fuck that, no matter, I, I, I'm born here. I know everybody, no matter how much bread it is, whatever, I'm gonna be here with my niggas, you feel me? But shit just changes when you get bread, you know what I mean? So it was meant in, in a literal sense, but also in like, you know, in a metaphorical way, like, I'm never going to forget where I came from. So Prodigy had the infamous interlude on that album. Right. Where he basically said, you know, run up on me, you're going to get shot, stabbed, or knuckled up. 
and you know, I got it on me everywhere I go. And it, you never really heard anyone say something like that on an album before. Like, what was really the meaning behind that? I mean, you know, P would know better than anybody else. P was just being P. You know what I'm saying? Like, he would just come left field with some shit. You know what I mean? I didn't even know he was going to make that interlude. But when he made it, you know what I'm saying? I was like, well, that, that's P. You know what I'm saying? And it became, a, you know, a, one of the interludes to be remembered. Absolutely. I mean, I remember hearing it, you kind of got chills. Like, okay, this ain't a dude you want to fuck with right here. Yeah, like, yeah, he's crazy. Right, and he even said, you know, I'm a little skinny motherfucker. I ain't the toughest dude in the world, but shit. And that's about who get off first. Right. That was P. That was P. So the album finally gets completed. Yeah. Where, you know, now Shook Ones 2 is doing his thing. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have a lot of times in music where you have a huge single and the album ends up doing nothing. When you guys completed the album, did you know you had a classic on your hands or not, not really? You know, me, I'm always like really hard, like, like a real tough critic on myself. You know what I'm saying? I could have kept going and making the album and never fucking stopping until somebody stopped me. But we had to eventually stop. And I settled on the album. I was like, fuck it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, this is, this is a dope album, you know what I'm saying? But did I think it was going to get the way it got? To, to, no, I didn't think that. So when it did come out, what happened? So when it came out, Shook Ones is just popping off, and we just started getting all of this notoriety, you know what I'm saying, performing everywhere and things of that nature, shit being played on the radio, and... We just had like huge, a huge following, you know? It just, we just had a lot of attention on us. Was that the point that you moved out of the projects? Nah, I was still there. I was still in the projects. You know what I'm saying? I just bought a, a little hoopty. Now I'm able to get around. But I was still living in the fucking projects, you know what I'm saying? Because that's all I knew. I, I didn't want to leave the projects, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to learn how to get a crib on my own, you know what I'm saying? I felt comfortable in apartment 3A, 12th Street. I, that, what? I'm with my niggas, we made it, you know? Shit was, nah, I wasn't going nowhere. Okay, so the first album comes out and it goes gold, I guess? Yeah, it went gold. Okay, you now have a gold plaque. Right, hell yeah. So then it's time to work on the second album. Why, why the name Hell on Earth? Um, because that year when we started making that album, a lot of bad shit just started happening, you know what I mean? With my brother dying, you know what I'm saying? P caught getting into an accident with one of the twins dying and another kid in there named Harry and all of that, him dying. And shit was just like fucked up, like, you know, so we just, this dark cloud was just over us, you know what I mean? Okay, now before that album dropped, Tupac ended up dissing you guys. Right. The, now, before that happened, did you and Tupac have any sort of interaction anything. I never met him. I never met him a day in my life. I saw him before from a, a distance. I was like, oh shit, that's Tupac at like some thing called Jack the Rapper in Atlanta, but I never met him a day in my life. Okay, so you, you don't know him. Right. You guys, did you guys diss him at all or was there anything towards Tupac before, before the, the, the situation? We... I ne P didn't diss him. I, I never dissed him. I always wondered why did he come at us. The only thing I could think of is like on Survival of the Fittest when we like thug like still living it, maybe he took offense to that. Maybe, you know what I'm saying? That's the only thing I could think of because I never ran into him, never said nothing about him. But at the same time, I was happy that he said something about it because so, I didn't give a fuck. I was like, what, word, two about we got beef with that nigga? It's like, that's what's up. Right, because I interviewed Bone Thugs in Harmony. When you say fuck all the bullshit, we all thugs, was there some sort of 
thing I mean, over the thug name or, or something? I mean, yeah, it was some words said about Pac on the box before about who is these dudes claiming thugs and all of that. You know what I'm saying? You know how he was, a little hot headed and then, but once we all seen each other and, and face to face with it, 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 it got squashed real quick. There you go, see? I do. So, I wasn't so too maybe far off. He was protective of that thug name. Right, because he kind of like. You know, he, he started that, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, thug life, you know what I mean? But we was already saying that shit around our way anyway, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like we was taking this shit from him. He was like, shit, you know, whatever, thugged out. Okay. So Hit Him Up comes out. Right. Do you remember where you were when you heard it the first time and what you thought? I can't remember the first time, well, it's so long ago, I can't remember where I was at, but I can give you the general feeling when I heard it. I was like, yeah, this is the gift that keeps on giving. I was like, oh shit. I was like, thank you, my nigga, like straight up, tell these niggas, like we somebody to worry about. You feel me? Like, yeah, no doubt. So I, I, I never had bad feelings for Tupac, even when he was saying that kind of shit, because inside I was like, Psh. You know, that's validation. Like, we on that nigga radar. That's what's up. Right. At the time, Tupac was not only the biggest rapper in the game, but just one of the biggest artists, period. Word. You know what I mean? So, he was up there with Madonna and, and everyone else. Yeah, and he was, like, you know, saying shit about us. I was like, fuck it. Okay. Now, how did Prodigy take it? Because Tupac, you know, took a shot at him with the whole sickle cell thing. See, yeah, P was tight about that. T P was tight because, you know, it's one thing to, to go at niggas, you know, lyrically or whatever, whatever, but when you calling out a nigga's sickness, something that he don't got no control over, now P took that personal. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, if P was here today to to, to, to speak on it, I'm I'm sure, you know, that part right there, he would always tell you that he wasn't feeling that part. Yeah, I mean that was definitely a low blow. For sure. You know, but at that point, Tupac really didn't give a fuck. He was saying that he fucked Biggie's wife. I mean, it was like no holes barred at that point. Yeah, anything was liable to come out of his mouth. You guys end up running into Tupac and the Outlaws at one point. Well, we never, not, I don't remember running into Tupac, but I know that we ran into the Outlaws. But this is after, okay. this is after Tupac already passed away. Okay. And we was okay. on the same, we was on the same bill. Okay, so so let's we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So, so Tupac dropped "Hit 'Em Up," right? And then on your second album, I mean technically your third, but you know on "Hell right. on Earth," you guys drop dropped a uh, drop a gem on him. Right, we dropped. And that. that was that was a response to Tupac. Yeah, we dropped drop a gem on him. The shit was popping. Radio started playing it. It was about to be on, and. The dude gets killed. He gets shot first. You know what I'm saying? So he's in like critical. They pull the record. Just off of that on a, a loan. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we can't run with this single. He just got shot. He in critical. Pulled. And that was like, was going to be our like ill, you know, second album. Come, come back. Like, yeah, this is how we coming. You know what I mean? Like. But he got shot and, and then died days later. Right, that was the whole Vegas situation. Right. You know, some of the lines in there, I had the whole New York State aiming at your face. Um, you know, shot through, didn't even know half of my crew, like, think fast, get reminded of the robberies in Manhattan. You know what happened, 60 G's with a gun clapping. Like, you, you, you start, you're talking about the quad shooting, the, the quad studio shooting. Right, yep. I mean, before, before he died, how did the whole East Coast, West Coast beef really affect you guys? Because you guys were thrown into it, uh, you know, without exactly even, you know, participating in it. I mean, it definitely made you kind of, I mean, me, made me kind of leery about fucking around on the West Coast, you know what I'm saying? as I'm sure they probably was the same way coming to New York because it was so over sensationalized, you know, East Coast, West Coast, when it wasn't even really that at all. Right, because they interviewed Tretch. When you got that motherfucking Vibe magazine, right? 
Well, you see Big and Puff on the cover, East versus West. When I saw that fucking cover, I said, man, what the fuck is going on? Gangsters don't read articles. Niggas on the East Coast like, yo, it's on. Wait till them West Coast niggas come out here. West Coast like, oh, it's on. Wait till them East Coast niggas come out here. So it baited up a whole shit that fucking went down that had just so many cycles of all Biggie followers and riders, all Pac riders, motherfuckers that didn't even know neither one of them, gangster ass motherfuckers, it could have really turned into a motherfucking East Coast, West Coast war. Yeah, they made that up, like, you know what I mean? Where it was only beef between, uh, you know, Big and them and, and uh, you know, I guess, was, was, was Tupac beefing with them at that time? Yeah. So, yeah. so, but they happened to be from just different coasts, you know what I'm saying? So they like East, West, like. That should sell more magazines for them if they put it like that. Were you at the Source Awards when when Suge came on stage? Nah, I don't. I don't think I was at that one. Uh, nah, I definitely wasn't at that one. Yeah, and that and that really kind of set things off. Yeah, that, that set off the bad feelings between Death Row and, and and Bad Boy, and it turned into an East Coast West Coast thing kind of on stage because they were on the right, East Coast. Right, right, right. So you know you can't fault give uh, Vibe Magazine all the blame, you know what I mean? It, I mean, something did happen at that Source Award that definitely turned the tables and it did kind of make, put a title on it, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, but Vibe coined it, coined the phrase. Right. Is, it, we're still talking about it to this day. It would have stayed in that room hadn't, you know what I'm saying, Vibe coined the phrase, you know what I'm saying, East Coast versus West Coast shit. Okay, so, you guys drop, you know, drop a gem, a gem on them. It was supposed to be a single, but it still stayed on the album. Right. Kept it on the album. And then, and then Tupac ends up dying. Right. And from everyone I've talked to, um, you know, like Greg Nice, The Outlaws, uh, you know, a lot of people that are close to Pac. Pac didn't want this East Coast, West Coast beef, and he was actually working on a One Nation album Right, you know, to try to bring together, you know, like boot camp click and you know Tretch and and all these other people from the East Coast with West Coast people and down south people like Outkast and so forth to try to do a One Nation album to try to heal all this damage that had been done. Yeah, I, I could believe that because he he was fucking with Buckshot Shorty hard, you know what I mean? From what I remember, and everybody knows he was fucking with Tretch, so I definitely believe that. But you know those little chain of events happened before he could even do that. You know what I mean? He still was on his East Coast, West Coast shit for a second. I guess he had to do that. But I could see him spinning away from that later if he wouldn't have got killed easy. Because, you know what I'm saying, he, at the end of the day, he was a diplomat. You know what I'm saying? He, he was diplomatic with his shit. You know what I'm saying? So, and Pac was smart. So I could see that he, he, he would have spent off and did that. Yeah. So... Hell on Earth comes out, it goes gold again. Right. You now have two gold albums under your belt. Yep. The money situation better by this point? Definitely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You moved out of the projects? Yeah, yeah, I had to after that. Like, not because of the bread, but, you know, I started thinking to myself, like, you know what I'm saying? Nobody bulletproof, you know what I mean? And, you know, certain people, they just not rational. They don't, they not working with logic, so... You know, you don't, you don't never really want to dangle meat in front of wolves, you know what I'm saying? And so I was like, let me get a little apartment somewhere because now I, I find myself, you know, coming back to the hood three o'clock in the morning by myself, bent and all of that. And you know what I'm saying? I'm like, nah, fuck that. Let me get myself a nice little secure place and then hang the projects every day. You know what I'm saying? And shit like that. So that, that's how I was moving. So the third album. Murder music. Before it comes out, it got heavily bootlegged. Word. How how upsetting was that situation? That shit was really upsetting because now we gotta do the whole shit over. You know what I'm saying? It's like, damn, like how did that happen? Like who did that? 
You know what I mean? So now we had to do songs over and crazy shit, man. It made things take longer. Well, Nas, I heard, had a verse on the album, but it didn't get cleared. Um, I don't remember that. I don't remember him doing a verse and not getting cleared because we ultimately ended up doing his mind. So what verse is, you know what I'm saying? He got cleared for his minds. Um, I don't remember no verse not being able to be cleared because we ended up doing a video to a song that was on the Murder Music album. Okay. All right. I, th I think it didn't get cleared for like Europe or something. I mean, there's some sort of weird story behind it, but maybe, maybe. maybe I got it wrong. <laughs> maybe. So you guys ended up doing Quiet Storm, which was a dope song. But then the Quiet Storm remix with Lil' Kim is what kind of went to the stratosphere. Right. So, so w what was the story behind that? So now we we making the um the uh, murder music album, blah blah blah. I had the quiet storm beat. P came to the crib. He loved the beat. I ain't really care about the beat too fucking much. He was like, yo, this shit is crazy. So he did a whole song to it. We make the whole album. It's time to do the album. They like, yo, we gonna do this song for the first single. Prodigy's on it by itself. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was like, damn. I was like, yo, I'm not even on the song. They was like, yeah. You did the beat, fuck it. They was like, yo, just do the, do the hook. Fuck it, I'm a team player, you know what I'm saying? So I just did the hook. I was like, fuck it, it's all good, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm good, you know what I'm saying? I played my position. And we did it, you know what I'm saying? Did the whole ill video in Hollywood, you know what I'm saying? Stunts and all that crazy shit, shit was dope. But then we was like, yeah, we need to do a remix, try to get the, you know what I'm saying, the females on board. Who the fuck could we fuck with? Of course, it was Little Kim. You know what I'm saying? We hollered at her. She came to the studio. She was writing her verse, or at least I seen her writing it definitely for sure. So I don't even be knowing what people be saying because I seen her writing. So, boom. She did her verse. That shit just fucked me up. It shit just fucked me up. Word. I, I, I think that might be one of the best Little Kim verses, you know what I'm saying, of all time. She, you know what I'm saying? And she got a lot of good verses, but that was hot damn ho. You know, girls hear that to this day, and they just love that shit. Yeah, yeah, that was probably, you might say that was her greatest verse in terms of when you think, you know, to this day, the, the verses that stand out with Lil' Kim, that was probably the one. Yeah, word, and, and, and it was on our album, so that was just a blessing. I mean, she got classic songs, and that this is one of them. You know what I mean? Right. It's almost like the song is her song, too. It's, I mean, it's hers. She could go do what she want with the song. You know what I'm saying? That's how right. ill she killed it. You, you did the beat to that? Yep. Right, and that was, I guess you flipped White Lines? Yep, I slowed it down. I threw some keys on top of it, a few drums, and the rest is history. Okay. So then this album, does that go gold as well? Platinum. Platinum. At this time. <laughs> Platinum. Now we like, we, we move it up. You know what I'm saying? It just, it just start getting better and better. You know what I mean? Right. And why the name Murder Music? You know what? I always left the titles to P. You know what I'm saying? I never gave a fuck about naming the shit, whatever. I just wanted to do the songs. I'm tired. I'm exhausted at this point. What you want the album name to be? Okay, fuck it. That's what we run it with. Murder Music. Okay. <laughs> Let's okay. go. So now you have a Platinum plaque. But then you end up leaving Loud after that. But that, that was what, they were getting bought by Sony and so forth? Yeah, we didn't leave Loud. You know, Loud was leaving. You know what I'm saying? Loud was, something happened internally with the business and Steve Rifkin. Whether it's good or bad, I don't know. But they had to do something where they was out and we was left to the distributor, which was Sony, you know what I'm saying, at the time. And we like, damn, man, we, we spent like five years with this family right here, you know what I mean? And it was over. It just wasn't the same. And we was in the middle of working on the Infamy album. Okay. Now, Prodigy said that he felt like that he was ripped off by Loud Records. Um, you know, whatever the homie say, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I believe him. I take him at his word that he felt like that. I mean, did you feel the same way? Um... You know, I, I didn't feel ripped off. I just felt like we was kind of 
left left hanging. You know what I'm saying? Left 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 to dry, hung out to dry. Like you know what I mean? And I, I'm sure they didn't mean it in, in 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 an intentional way because we was like family at this point. But it was business, so I guess they had to do what they had to do. You know what I'm saying? As far as being ripped off, I didn't see no numbers that that I could point to and look at statements and be like, oh, we, you know, we got ripped off, you know what I mean? Yeah. So at one point, uh, Jay-Z drops the takeover. Right. And he, he disses Mob Deep as well. Right. What, what was the reason behind that? I think, you know what I'm saying, P had said something about Jay-Z in like the Source magazine or some shit like that, because P had taken offense to uh, Jay saying something about New York's been soft ever since Snoop crushed the buildings, and P took offense to that. Okay, so then the takeover comes out. Now from the biggest artist in the world once again. It, but this time it wasn't the same feeling, at least not for me. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, how did you feel when you heard Takeover? I was I definitely wasn't feeling that. I wasn't mad at Jay-Z, but I definitely wasn't feeling the whole situation because I'm like, damn, you know what I'm saying? We all from New York. I'd rather be, you know, allies with somebody, you know what I'm saying, from my city than to be enemies with them. You know what I mean? So it didn't feel the same. Okay. How did P take it? Uh, you know, P was he, he was fuming. You know what I'm saying? P was, P, you know, I mean, we we had a lot of discussions over it, you know, and P, P wasn't feeling it. Okay. And then there was the infamous Summer Jam screen situation. Right, right. Where, uh, you know, Jay-Z put a picture of, of Prodigy, I guess, when he was like a dancer, when he was, you know, younger. Yeah, in his, in his grandmother's dance school. Yeah, exactly. How did you guys take that? I mean, the way I remember it was that we was overseas and somebody had gave us a call and they told us that Jay-Z put Prodigy's uh, picture, up on, picture on the screen. Um, we wasn't feeling that. We, we wasn't feeling it. Nobody, I mean, likes to be made a mockery of, but what made it worse was that he kind of misrepresented the picture, right? Like the actual picture versus what he said the picture was. Like he said, Everybody's saying, oh, Prodigy was in a tutu. That definitely clearly wasn't true, you know what I mean? But everybody just ran with it, you know what I mean? So that just made it like, ah, uh, you know what I'm saying? That's like, whatever. Like, but he, you know, whatever. He wasn't feeling it, I wasn't feeling it. Did you guys ever respond to that? Um, I, I responded to it in a subtle way because, you know, just, you know, fuck it, this is the team right here. P was a little bit more overt with it, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't like the whole situation, you know what I mean? I was like, damn, I, I really don't even want to touch this situation. I don't even want to respond, like, really. Not on some, like, niggas is, is scared to respond to him because we'll go with anybody, obviously. But I'm like, damn, son from the, he from the city, you know what I'm saying? He from the home city. So I was like, I really wasn't feeling it like that, you know what I mean? So I kind of, like... I was just kind of falling back from it. Right, and I heard that P was really bothered by that for a while. Yeah, he, like I said, he, he wasn't feeling that at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. He wasn't feeling it. How did it feel when years later, you know, Jay-Z starts naming all the people that influenced him and he named, I forgot if it was Mob Deep or Prodigy, but he, he gave right. you guys a shout out. Yeah, I remember he said something about Mob Deep, something like that, uh, clap for him or something like that. You know what I'm saying? That that just goes to show you that that little altercation was unnecessary. You understand what I'm saying? Because motherfuckers was fucking with each other. You know what I'm saying? So that altercation was unnecessary, but it happened, and that's just that's the way it is. But it was it was a good acknowledgement, whatever. I mean, not like we needed validation, but you know, at the same time, it's like you know, mending you know old wounds, so to speak. Yeah. So, 
I remember hanging out with with you guys at one point. Um, and I remember Prodigy had the bulletproof SUV. Right. And I was just thinking, and, and you guys were living like in Jersey or something at the time. Nah, I never lived across the water. Well, no, I mean, P was in, P was in, like he was up, up north, like, like, but still in New York State. No, it, it was, it was, his, it was your manager at the time. Okay, all right, yeah, right. So I was hanging out with him, and then you know, right, the right, Prodigy right. was there. And right. Prodigy had the bulletproof SUV. Yeah. Why at that point in your careers, and this, this is like two thousand four or something like that. This was you guys had been out for a while. You're established. You're not living in the projects anymore. Right. Why, why did Prodigy feel, you know, a need to have you know this two hundred thousand dollar bulletproof car? You know, I really, I really can't say why. You know, he probably. I, I mean, I, I guess he figured. You know, we was down with G Unit and whatever drama they probably had might, you know, come to us being signed to the label. So I'm, I'm assuming that that's why he got it. You know what I mean? Just to be like, you know, just in case if niggas want to get at us because of, you know, whatever they might have had going on. You know what I'm saying? So that's why he, he, he probably got it. But. I never got no bulletproof truck. Right. And then, you know, along with the bulletproof truck, Prodigy continued to carry guns with him everywhere he went. For sure. Until that one day where he gets pulled over. Right, because they was on him. They was following him everywhere. You know, the hip hop police, whatever the fuck you call them, they was following him. Right. And I guess when they pulled him over, I guess Alchemist was in the car as well. Yup, that's what I heard. Alchemist was there. And, and they try to get Prodigy to set up 50 Cent. That's what P told me. That's what P told me. And I was like, damn, it's, it's like that? I was like, damn. But yeah, you know, that, P would have never did that. Yeah, I interviewed Prodigy about that. They try to get me to confess, oh, whose gun is it? Is it your gun? Is it your friend Alchemist's gun? Like, so, you know, the kind of case it was, I already knew it was a legal search because they didn't ask to search my vehicle and that's against the law, you know what I mean? So I already knew in my head what, it was, what this was gonna be. I've been through it many times already. And they see that you're not cracking on none of those questions. They say, yo, look, really, we just wanna know um, about 50 cents. So then Prodigy ends up getting locked up for three and a half years. Yep. How did it feel to have your rhyme partner, you know, just your, what I assume is your best friend, suddenly gone like that? Man, I just felt, I, I felt bad for him, you know what I'm saying, more so than me, to be selfish and like, oh man, you know what I'm saying, all these fucked up. I felt bad for him because I didn't want him to go to jail and do time, you know what I'm saying, for shit like that. We, we, we was thinking positive, hoping that he might beat it, but more and more it was looking like he wasn't going to beat it, and he had to go away for a minute, and I, I, I felt bad. Like, I was like, damn, you know what I mean, fuck. Yeah. Now, while he was locked up, he had what was known as the, the Prodigy Prison Rants, <laughs> where uh, I guess he talked about, uh, you know, the Illuminati. He said that Jay-Z was part of the Illuminati. He said owls were demonic. And a, a bunch of stuff that was a little, little weird. Like, how were you taking all this stuff when, when he was locked up? I just let him believe what he wanted to believe at, on, on that level. You know what I'm saying? I, you know... I never get involved with that part. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just wasn't really into that. You know what I mean? I just, but I never second guessed what he believed. I was like, he he fuck with that shit. He believe it. That's what he say. I believe he believed that. Word. Not saying he wrong. All right. I'm like, okay. Prodigy gets out, and Mob Deep bro breaks up. But then you guys end up getting back together. I don't really care about the breakup. Part. Right, right. What what caused you guys to reconcile and get back together? Um, I you know the, 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 on, on 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 two two different things. You know what I'm saying? We was like brothers. We like brothers. You know what I'm saying? So we we definitely missed each other. You know what I'm saying? And number two, it was bad for business. You know what I mean? It was it was it was definitely the money was different. 
You know what I mean? You know, though we could both go off and do our thing, the foundation needed to come back together. You know what I mean? And, you know, we knew what time it was. So we hadn't seen each other in like a year. And when we knew it was time to go back to work, we hadn't spoken to each other on the phone. We just ended up in the studio together. What's up? Mm -hmm. Start recording like it was just <laughs> like we saw each other yesterday. We wasn't trying to explain <laughs> shit to each other, nothing. And I think everyone was just so happy to see Mob Deep back together at that point. I was happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I was definitely happy about that. So, in the past year, you know, because Prodigy has had his you know, his struggle with sickle cell. And, you know, he's talked about in interviews, he's talked about in songs. How was his health, you know, leading up to, to what happened recently? He was healthy. He, he was the most healthy that I ever fucking seen him. You know what I'm saying? He was barely getting sick, if any. You know, he was paying attention to his diet. He was good. You know what I mean? And, I, and I, I'm not even exaggerating. You could speak to his kids. You know what I'm saying? They'll tell you. You know what I'm saying? He was, you could look at the pictures from a lot of the shows. You know what I'm saying? He, he was good as far as I was concerned. Right, because I remember when Prodigy, got out of, you know, when Prodigy got out of prison, like he was like built. He looked like Word. great. He looked great. It was like the, the best I'd ever seen because Prodigy was always that little skinny dude. He comes yeah. out all diesel like, yeah. yo, okay. That's Word. what's up. For real, like you never seen nobody with a cigar cell looking like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He was like, boom, boom. I was didn't, we almost didn't want to take pictures with the nigga. His shit was looking all brolic. I was like, damn, son. I was like, <laughs> word. So you guys are on the Art of Rap tour. Uh, yeah. With Ice-T. You guys are in Vegas. What happens? We was in Vegas. He was doing a show. Not, not a show, like a, a club walkthrough in Miami, maybe two days before that already, you know what I'm saying? He had got a little sick out there. You know, he went to a club. I guess the temperature inside the club kind of fucked him up a little bit. So when he left, he was a little bit sick. He didn't go to the hospital. By the time he got to the, to the um, hotel in Miami, he was good. He said he felt better. He didn't have to go to the hospital or nothing like that, which he said surprised him. You know what I'm saying? He was like, damn, I'm surprised. I didn't even have to go to the hospital and this shit, uh, it got better. So I was like, word. He was telling me this shit when we was in Vegas. I was like, word. I was like, damn, I'm glad you good. Because usually when he gets sick, he not going to get on a plane, you know what I'm saying, the next day or nothing like that. But he was, he said he felt he got better. And then he, whatchamacallit, he got on a plane to Vegas the next day. So he spent the day in Vegas, a day before I even got there. But he was fine. You know what I'm saying? So I ended up flying in, into Vegas on, on, on a Saturday. He was already there on a Friday. And while I'm in the air, I'm texting them. And they in the movie theaters watching Tupac movie on that Saturday. So I was like, all right, boom, when I land, we're going to connect. I'm going to check in and we're going to meet up. All right, cool. I get to Vegas, I check in, and I'm like, me and him had, we started this regimen where we started eating better. Like, we started eating, like, good, like, like clean food and shit. So, you know, I land, and then I was like, fuck it, let me go to um, Whole Foods. So the movie had ended for him. He said, yo, where you at? I said, I'm in Whole Foods. He said, I'm on my way. So, boom, he, he meet us there. We get salads. All of that kind of shit, chicken, whatever. We go back to the room. We talking. He comes to my room. We kicking it for a little while and shit like that. He go eat. Perfectly fine. We did the show. It's like 110 degrees out there. That shit didn't seem to affect him. We did the whole show. And then after the show was over, the road manager told me, like, yo, P not feeling too good. I'm going to take him back to the room. And I might take him to the hospital. P want to go at like two in the morning. But I was saying to myself, if he not feeling good, fuck it, take him now. But P was like, nah, nah, nah. You know, I, 
I guess, you know, that since I didn't question it, he was like, two in the morning, two in the morning. It was already almost 11 o'clock. I'm like, fuck it. I was scheduled to leave at 8.30 in the morning. I had a flight already anyway, so I caught my flight. And it was like a like kind of routine, normal thing. If he got sick somewhere, a road manager would stay with him already and, you know, everybody else would fly out because it's just, you know, he's just there to get hydrated, pain medicine, he gonna be good, and then boom, he'll be out of the hospital in a few days. So when I left, I was checking up on him. I, I got back in on a Sunday, and I was checking up on him all the way until Monday, and on Monday, I told him that I'm gonna I'm call you tomorrow afternoon. Bet. Tuesday comes, and, and, and all the while, I'm checking his progress, you know what I'm saying? He getting better, he getting better, he getting better. So he was good, you know what I'm saying? He was getting better, he was out his bed, you know what I'm saying? Going to the bathroom on his own, walking around, he was eating food, you know what I'm saying? So it was only probably, he only would have had like maybe a day or two left in the hospital, if that. That's how he was, he was getting better. He wasn't feeling too much more pain, whatever, whatever. And uh, that Tuesday, it, something must have took a fucking turn for the worse. You know what I'm saying? And I got news that I would have never, ever, ever expected, ever in my life. When you got that call, well, well, how did you feel? I just knew that it was a lie. You understand what I'm saying? It was a rumor. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause I, I heard rumors about myself, I heard rumors about P, I heard rumors about other niggas, you know what I'm saying? And they, they never be true. You understand what I'm saying? Like, especially my, my, my homeboy, my dude, you know, uh, that he's dead and I just uh, got a progress report on him the night before that he good, he walking around, he joking, he eating food and somebody gonna say that he passed away like that. So I, I just knew it was a lie. But when I, when I came to the realization that it wasn't a lie, the shit just, it fucked me up. I, I, you know, I don't know. I just felt like I was like in a dream. You know what I'm saying? I was pinching myself, you know, like literally. And I just, it, it had to be a dream. Like it, it's, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. It just took me a while to really just say this is real because I go weeks sometimes without seeing P. We, we go weeks without seeing each other. So it just didn't seem real. Like as if he's almost gonna come and walk into this room right now. You understand what I'm saying? Like that's how I still feel. You know what I mean? Like I don't even know if the shit hit me like that. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I could watch videos of him right now and it's just seem, it seems like he's here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't believe it. I knew him longer than I didn't know him. So, I don't know. When he passed, there was the stories started to come out and, and there was a story about him choking, and then there was a story about him choking on an egg. Was there any truth to that at all? I spoke to somebody the day that he passed, and that was, that was close to him, and they said something about an egg, right? Then I spoke to somebody else that was you know, did, you know, close to, and said that he didn't eat. Uh, he couldn't have ate that morning because, you know, based on the time that he already passed. So, you know, I don't know, maybe they got the food wrong, you know what I'm saying, or what it is, but there's no way that he could have choked on an egg. Did they tell you what exactly caused his death? Was it choking or, or was it just his, his sickle cell flaring up or, or what was it? From what, I, oh, oh, from what I heard was that he threw up 
and it went into his lungs. That's what the official part of what I heard. And I, you know, I still got questions about like, you know, what the fuck do that mean? You know what I'm saying? He was fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, it's, a, it's such a massive loss at such a young age. Uh, it's it's too incredible. Yeah. A after his passing, BET did a tribute to to you guys, a and Master P went on like a rant, basically saying how fake that shit was and how, you know. Last year, you guys wouldn't have even got an invite to the BET Awards, right. and now they want to do, you know, this this type of thing, and how people don't get, you know, they don't get the love while they're still alive. Like, right. how did you take that? See, don't get me wrong, don't get it twisted. I fuck with Master P. You know what I'm saying? I love him. I love what he stands for. I love what he do. But my whole thing is this: like, if 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 a certain company don't give a motherfucker the props while he alive. And, you know, at the end of the day, they say, hey, man, let's acknowledge this brother. I mean, are we, are we going to criticize him for that? I mean, so just because they didn't acknowledge us, you know, while motherfuckers was alive, so that means don't acknowledge him in his death, too, as well, right? Because it's just fuck it. I mean, that don't make no sense. The criticism is valid. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, it should be like a little bit, you should say like, you know, you know what? At least they acknowledged. You know what I'm saying? Because just because they didn't acknowledge in, in life, fuck it, let them keep not acknowledging in death. So you got to give them a little bit of credit. They try to do a little bit of something, right? You know what I'm saying? They wasn't making, they not making money off of it. They, they did acknowledge, you know what I'm saying? That, you know, and it was, once upon a time, we, we was on there too, you know what I'm saying, on, on, the, on the videos and all of that. But I get where Master P coming from, but my whole thing is this, that uh, just because he wasn't acknowledged, just keep not acknowledging him. Yeah, so, I agree. But like I said, I love Master P, love what he stands for, but I just have a different spin on it. They made a mural in Queensbridge for Prodigy. And then someone ended up throwing paint on the mural and they ended up cleaning it up and then they threw paint again to the point where they actually had to take it down. Like, how did you feel when you heard that? That shit had me mad. It had me very angry, you know what I'm saying? Um, that, that, that was uncalled for, you know what I'm saying? That's like, that's petty. That's as petty as you can fucking get. Because I'm sure whatever it is they was mad over didn't level up to that. You understand what I'm saying? You gotta think about it. This man is a legend. Who the fuck are you? What are your feelings worth, my nigga? You understand what I'm saying? Like, wh what what happened? Did he did he do something to your kids? Did he steal money from you? Did he smack somebody you love? He didn't do none of that. You know what I'm saying? And you gonna throw paint on it? That just goes to show you. Who, what kind of people in this world every day that we deal with. When you got motherfuckers running around that's willing to do shit like that, now you see why we be rapping about the shit we be rapping about. Because we got motherfuckers that's doing shit like that. Gangsters don't do that. You know what I'm saying? Gangsters be like, man, you know what? Fuck it. You know what I'm saying? They go on there. Boom. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. Respect to them. I seen gangsters go to their enemies' funerals and pay respect. But to do that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really coward, you know, cowardly. To the point where clearly you had a problem with this dude, but you were always too scared to approach him, you know, while he was alive. That says a lot. What it says to me, and this is my opinion, is that it says more about that person than it does to their anger to prodigy. I, I think they're not happy with life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They mad. They, they, they stuck there, so they bored. They got to do something. You stuck where you at. Right, because, I mean, if you really think about it, prodigy put Queensbridge on his back to such an extent. I, I, know, I had never heard of Queensbridge you know, before you guys start rapping it. I mean, I guess Nas as well, but you know, you you guys took that 
and, and gave it to the world to such a degree that people that will never go to Queens, Queensbridge, people that will never even come to America know about this small section in the world. And, and it's been romanticized to such a degree that why would you not want a mural of this guy in Queensbridge? That shit is beyond me, man. Some things just don't, it's, it's just illogical. You know what I'm saying? It's just, he, he, he repped, you know, to the day that he left. You know what I'm saying? He sung that song over and over and over again. You know what I'm saying? Queensbridge Murderers, the mall comes equipped for warfare. You know, he repped Queensbridge to the day that he died. The last song he sung was saying the name Queensbridge on stage, shook ones. You know what I'm saying? The last song that man ever sung. The, the, there's been a lot of music to come out of New York and come out of Queens. But I've always felt that you guys reignited gangster rap in New York. To, to a level that other people really did not. You know what I mean? You, you guys brought people into the Queensbridge projects. And when it's all said and done, what do you think is the mark that Mob Deep left on music? I mean, uh, we just, we spoke truth to our lyrics. You know what I mean? Uh, like, we never really, we, we, we never conformed to what was going on to the times, we, 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 we spit what we knew, you know what I'm saying, and we kept it street all the way. Yeah, and millions of records sold, timeless songs, classic albums, it, the, the mark that, that Mob Deep has left on the world just can't be denied. Not at all, you know what I mean? And um, you know, I'm glad that I got a chance to work with P and to create that music that is, you know, is timeless, you know what I'm saying? The music that we created, and it's hard to, to, for your best artists out there today to duplicate or replicate something like that to become on a legendary status, you know what I'm saying? I don't give a fuck who sell 10 million records, but will he be remembered 30 years, 40 years, 50 years from now? You know what I'm saying? Will he be remembered? And, you know, we, we left a mark like that. Yeah, absolutely. And especially people, you know, of my age range that were there when it first came out to really experience it and, and to feel, feel the music and, and you know, hear the cars drive by playing it, it is, it's indescribable. Yeah, man, it was, it, it was a great feeling at the time, and it's still a great feeling now to know that we left a mark, you know what I'm saying, on music, period, you know what I'm saying, with the music that we did, because all the music that we did, it was from the heart, you know what I mean? And once you make it from the heart and you don't make it for the dollars, you end up with timeless music. You know what I'm saying? Once you start doing it for the dollars, people can see right through that. You know what I mean? They can feel it, that you just, you just did for the opportunity. You know what I mean? You're like, fuck it, let me make a record that sound like that. Or let me do a record similar to this. We didn't do that. We was like, fuck it, we just gonna make our shit. You know what I mean? We gonna make it and it's gonna work for us. And it did. You know, when you look back upon your friendship with Prodigy, what do you think was one of your greatest memories and and something that people may not know about Prodigy that only you know? Um, one of the greatest things about me and his friendship is that though I knew we both had love for each other, even after all of the problems that we went through as brothers, because you know brothers go through internal drama, you know what I'm saying, it's just family in general, is that he never hesitated to let me know that he loved me by saying it. Like, yo, son, I love you, man. Like, fuck that, have, like, word. And will always be just, you know, doing acts of kindness, you know what I'm saying, to me. You know what I'm saying, when he could have been bitter behind some of the shit we went through, but he never held on to that. 
You know what I'm saying? Because he already, we was like brothers. You know what I'm saying? Like we was brothers. You know what I'm saying? So no matter what we went through, you know what I'm saying? Behind the scenes, me and him in a room like that, it was like, you know, he, would, he wouldn't hesitate to let me know that, yo, son, I love you, man. You know, fuck that. Like, and that, I think that was one of the greatest things that I could say about him that, you know, he, he put, you know what I'm saying, our brotherhood before, you know, shit that people could probably put into his head or things that he could let his head fill up with, you know what I mean? And because the love was just genuine. You know what I mean? And, that, and that's what I could appreciate most about our relationship. Yeah, man. Uh, once again, so sorry for your loss. You know, I, words can't, can't express what, what you went through and what you're still going through. But at the very least, you guys know that what you've left on this earth will never go away and will always be appreciated. And your children will be able to sit there and look at it and listen to it and, you know, have a smile on their face when, when they hear it. Or for real. For real. Havoc, man, definitely a pleasure. Appreciate you coming in today, man. Thank you, Vlad.